Hello and welcome to this week's GG Weekend Watch, kindly sponsored by SBK as usual. And as usual, you have your regular team of Daryl Carter, Andrew Mount and myself to look forward to this weekend's racing. And we have a whole host of races to get through. We have nine races from Kempton and Warwick to look at this weekend. Some intriguing handicaps, some lesser, smaller run of field races as well, but some graded contests thrown in too. And some potential potential Cheltenham Festival and potential Grand National pointers as well to be looking forward to. So plenty to cover. We're going to kick straight into it as soon as I just cover a couple of winners that we had last weekend. I think you have to give us a little bit of slack for last weekend. Very tricky, as we know, in January it can very often be. So we just had the couple of winners. Gunsight Ridge winning at 11 to 4 for Daryl and myself. And then Hydroplane winning at 25 to 1 for Daryl. So Daryl was really picking up the slack for us then last weekend. So very well done, Daryl. And hopefully more of the same than this week. So we will begin at work. We will begin with the 118. This is a two-mile handicap chase for five-year-olds and over where we have just four declared runners, where Sky Pirate heads the weights off of his mark of 157 and really forces the weights down for the other three runners here. So, Andrew, how do you play this opening race, please? Yeah, interesting race, despite there only being four runners. Sky, Pi Sky Pirate obviously won it uh, last year as the 6-4 to favourite. Uh, he was on a much higher mark this time around. Not really been in the same sort of form, even though he was you know faced some tough tasks, particularly last time out behind Shishkin. Uh, I'm going to side with um, the progressive not available, who has really impressed me the last twice. Now, he's had four goes for Matt Shepard, second, third, and a couple of wins. Uh, I wrote him up after that third to witness protection. Um, and since then, say so he's gone two from two, 14 to one at Newbury. And last time out, five to two favourite at Ludlow. He really impressed me with his battling attitude that day. I thought he was in trouble. He's battled back to win by half a length from Gumball. I just thought he's going the right way. And, uh, you know, he's probably going to be. Um, a bigger price than he should be because he's trained by Mac, Matt Shepard and mm. you know not a Nichols or a Henderson and uh, yeah, I thought five to two second favourite was probably a touch of value against um, Brave Siaska the, uh, the one who I think is the danger didn't really like Sky Pirate and I'm still very wary about backing Dan Skelton horses on Saturdays in January you know the whole thing about them having the flu jab sort of between mm. Christmas and New Year and perhaps not being at their best at this time of year. So, you know, I wasn't usually interested in fast buck for that reason. So a uh, bit, bit boring. The two I like are the two that had the betting 11 to 8 and 5 to 2. But I'll go with the 5 to 2 not available. Yes. So which so is I available. See. Yeah, we, which is available, funnily enough. Yeah, thank goodness it is. Or 11 to 4 is available as well, then about not available. So ideal. And avoiding fast buckling for the skeleton yard, because obviously the skeleton's following the Nichols trend, does it make sense for giving the flu jabs in January? So that's how Andrew is playing our opener. Daryl, how do you assess it? Uh, very similar, really. I, I thought the top two at the market, of the mar at the market, top at the top of the market, my goodness me, what's going on? Um, <laughs> Great start, thought, sorry, you had a 25 to 1 win, you can forgive it. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were the two to focus on. Um, Sky Pirate, I thought he caught the eye a little bit last time at um, at Kempton. I don't know what they're going to do with him going forward because he's sort of stuck on too much of a high mark for a handicap and he's mm. not quite up to the level of a graded horse. Perhaps they will be here to try and win back-to-back -back win, back -back wins in this race and this might be, you know, be the target. Uh, I thought Brave Siaska was very much the, the horse on the up in the field. I, not available is as well, but I just thought not available really has been crying out for a step up and trip. Mm -hmm. um, I thought Brave Siaska, who beat Tuki Duki here on his last visit by 10 lengths and then went and bolted up at Ascot, I thought he's just a really progressive horse. I don't actually want him to win because I fancy their Finamble Civilla to go in the Grand Annual. Um, mm. But... Spanisha Williams did win this with a horse called uh, Dare Me back in 2014 and then he went to the Grand Annual and then I don't want Fernando Silva stepping up to the plate. Listen, that's that's <laughs> what's going on in my mind at the moment but in terms of this race, I think Brave Siaska is the, the most likely winner of it for me. I think Not Available will be staying on strongly. Um, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't really find too much of an angle to be honest and, and mm. I didn't really want to back anything at the prices so a bit of a nothing race really for me. If I'm really honest. Yeah. It, it is really, though, isn't it? With only the four runners here, there's not from many betting angles. But uh, while Sarah has his existential crisis said about the Venetia Williams runners for the uh, for the Grand Annual, potentially, we will leave that race and just hope that uh, that his selection for Cheltenham then uh, manages to step up to the plate for that race. So we will move on to the 150 at Warwick. This is another small field 
for our next race. It's time for the grade two novices chase for five-year-olds and over over three miles, where three under through five bids to bring up a four-timer. And he's been found another small field graded race to do exactly that. So, Daryl, do you side with him here or take him on? Or how do you play this race? I just don't get involved. I, I, I yeah. totally agree with what you just said. They, they've really cherry-picked these races mm. for three under through five, haven't they? And yeah. they're, they're probably going to end up with a horse that's that's got nowhere to go, um, essentially, because I don't think he's quite up to graded class. I think he has been cherry pick these races. He's a nice enough horse, that's for sure. Um, but, yeah, you don't, you kind of don't want to take him on, but you wouldn't want to put all your eggs in one basket at 8 to 15 either. I thought mm. Mink Condition, again, was the right second fav. for thought uh, Jenny Candidish's horse was the one that's going to give him most to do. I thought it was a good staying performance last time at Haydock to outstay uh, Ashtown Lad, who had uh, jumped the last couple of lengths in front. He's a real strong stayer, but I think he just wants deep, deep ground and just a real slog of a of a race. Um, of the rest, I didn't really want to get involved. I thought Mossy Fenn was interesting just from a, a viewing perspective. He's been off the track a long time. He always looked like he was going to be a much better chaser than, a, than he was a hurdler. He's got significant potential. There's no no doubt about that. Um, any news has been so in and out. God, you don't know what, what, what horse is going to turn up on the day at the moment. Uh, and then Doyen Breed, I just didn't think he'd be quite good enough. Um, in this company so uh, yeah again I'm sorry to be boring but there is no bets in the first two races that worry for me yeah no when I when I first looked through these races earlier on today when we got our decks and I thought oh god this is going to be a steady start to a show isn't it because it's just <laughs> it's so difficult to get involved in these races like you say just hopefully some future angles to take out of these uh, rather than betting heats for these races. Andrew, do you have any stronger opinions on this race, please? Well, not really, but I'll give you a future angle. I think any news Ooh. won't win until he goes into a veteran's handicap chase in three years' time. <laughs> <laughs> so he's only seven. <laughs> Stick that one in your long-term tracker. Um, yeah, I mean, three under through five, he's been, as Daryl says, been very well placed. Since his race course debut, he's had nine runs below grade one companies. One eight of them finished second in the other. That was first time out, might have been first time over fences as well from memory. Um, there's an argument that he does jump out to his right on occasions. He might prove best right-handed. I mean, I, I thought he'd have run a, you know, a good race if he'd gone for the Corto Star over Christmas. But uh, obviously did it in his stable mate, Brave Man's Game, won that race. But yeah, I thought he's just going to you know, be out, out in front, isn't he? And you, you might think, oh, 8 to 15 is too short, but he would probably be trading about 1.3 after a fence or two. So, mm. you know, you could argue it's a good price if, if trading is your thing. I mean, Mink Condition, um, you know, won, you know, won gamely enough at, Her at uh, Haydock last time. Not always easy to come from off the pace there, but that running star would worry me here because, you know, probably going to be 8 to 1 after a couple of fences if he adopts his normal um, patient tactics. So... Not a race I was particularly wanting to, um, you know, get involved in. But, um, you know, if you've got a spare 1,500 quid, stick it on at 8 to 15, put into like, you know, um, 1.25 or something and uh, make yourself a few hundred quid. Yeah, there you go. There's a, there's a good example of a, of how to pet in that race then in the, in the 150 at Warwick for Andrew. So we will swiftly move on to the next race on Warwick's card and hopefully we'll start warming up into sort of more betting heats as we go through this podcast anyway. And up next is another grade two, but this time it's for the novice hurdlers. We have the Levington novice, novices hurdle for five-year-olds and over, over two mile five, where we have some well, we have had some really nice horses winning this race in recent years who have gone on well to actually run well in the Ballymore at the festival. So for all January is a quiet month, as we know. You do have some races such as this to potentially find a horse who may go under the radar somewhat for Cheltenham. But of course, it is disappointing that we only have seven runners lining up for this race. Um, but as I say, looking back through runnings of this race, you have Mossy Fenn, uh, who won this, went on to finish fifth in the Ballymore at a big price. Willoughby Court won this race, won the Ballymore. Deputy Dan won this in 2014 before finishing second in the Albert Bartlett. The new one won this in 2013 before winning the Ballymore. So you can find a Charterman angle in here potentially. But Andrew, who do you think will win this grade two, please? Uh, don't know. Uh, <laughs> that was the, uh, the, the way I was looking. I mean... There's several good chances too. I mean, party business, you know, was in the process of running a good race um, you know, last time out in the uh, uh, at Newbury in Grade One Company, the Chalo, before falling. But you know, he's going to be ridden patiently again. Tactics that, generally speaking, aren't what you want at Warwick, particularly in what could be a small field tactical. But well, it's going to be a small field tactical affair. Mm. Surrey Quest, 
is he that price because he's trained by Nicky Henderson rather than what he's achieved in, you know, winning at Doncaster last time? Would it, would it surprise you if he win? No. Do you want to back him at two to one? Probably not. Um, Viva Lavilla, Lavia, you've got the you know, Dan Skelton flu jab sort of thing hanging mm. over you. Will the horse be at his best at this time of year? Staghorn, you know, you can respect given that he's trained by Archie Watson, which normally means that this horse is going to go forward on a track that uh, such tactics generally help. And he made all, didn't he? It, um, was it Hereford last time yeah. out? Um, I mean, how do you like me now? The, the fact that he's been running in handicaps would, would worry me for him. Um, gentleman at arms, I, I, you know, he, he was more forward last time out, wasn't he? When winning, mm. I, I thought he had a squeak actually at a big price. Um, so, yeah, it, it wasn't a race I was particularly enamoured with. I, I would sort of be looking at Staghorn Gentleman at Arms, you know, if I was going to stick a couple in the place pot. But uh, I'd probably need to do more work on the race before Saturday, if I'm honest. Yeah, but a couple of horses then coming from the flat into the jumping game that Andrew are wanting to side with. And Staghorn, we know the ability he had on the flat anyway. And Gentleman at Arms, the step up and triple definitely suited him. He was flat to the boards, hence why he went forwards last time out at Huntingdon to try and basically outstay them on that track um, and that's how it worked out so yeah a couple of um of, of flat horse turn jump horse angles for Andrew Darrell yourself please for this race yeah party business with this um, don't need to mess around there uh, he's by far the best horse in the race he's run the fastest time figures by a country mile um, he was in the process of running a fantastic race at Newbury in the uh, in the cello hurdle before coming down uh, prior to that at Ascot he was he was only a fraction slower than John Bond from two out to the line. Um, and he had run a much faster circuit time, obviously, and ran over two miles five. Um, he's a pretty useful horse in his own right. I think there's about three in here that want to go forward and make the run in. Um, so there should be a good clip on for it for his hold-up tactics. I think he's a really nice progressive horse. He's got course experience. Um, he's actually given an inquiry, um, I think, on his last run about why he was being tenderly handled mm. um but he but he went and bolted up at ascot next time so it, it wasn't from a handicapping perspective i don't think um look i think he's the best horse in the race i agree with andrew i think i knew what they were going to do with this i knew they were going to stick the nicky henderson horse straight at the top of the market mm -hmm. um and i was hoping that was going to be the case just to get a little bit of value on party business he's around three to one i think he should be much shorter than that i think he should be about a seven to four six to four shot uh so i think he wins and i think he's a good bet Oh, very punchy. Darren started punchy and normally gets punchier as we go through this. So he's had he's had a little bit of a lull for the first few races to really get into his stride. So it's all like come out at once now, I feel, with party business there around three to one and probably is the horse with the sort of most solid form, I guess, in this race and in a pretty sort of trappy, slightly underwhelming, may I say, uh, great two novices hurdle then at Warwick in the 225. Now, hopefully... More of a betting heat than in the three o'clock at Warwick. This is the classic chase, which is a grade three handicap for five rods and over, over three mile five, a race that I always love. And we can, as I said, at the top of the show, we can find all sorts of grand national potential angles in this race, of course, with these staying chases. But it is Jericho Rock, who currently heads the market at around five to one at the time of recording, from another novice in second in the market in Korach Rambler around a similar price as well. So, Daryl, do you side with a novice or a more exposed type in this race? I don't know. I think the top two at the, the, two at the top of the market are very, very strong. Um, it's very difficult to suggest they're not improving. It's very difficult to pick holes in what they've done. I think Korach Rambler is only just starting to come into himself. I thought he had plenty in hand at Cheltenham last time. I thought he was just hiding a little bit at the front uh, when he hit the front. Uh, Jericho Rock is definitely going to see out this trip as well, the way he finished at Newbury. Really impressed by the way him and St. Palais put that distance between themselves and the rest of the field after the second last at Newbury last time. Um, yeah, I found it very difficult to go against the two at the top of the market, but I thought one that was ahead of its mark would be a Claire Surf for uh, Emma Lavelle. Yeah. This horse was travelling really nicely at Banger um, before falling behind Snow Leopard S. Now, that form is, is very, very strong in the context of this race. And then at Chepstow last time, chased home a subsequent Welsh National winner. Um, but was, tra again, travelling nicely, hit five out really, really hard and just lost all momentum. Had to pick up and start to get going again. Lots of horses swamped him, but he still managed to stay on really strongly and finished third that day. Mm. I thought it was quite an eye-catching performance. The handicap has eased him two pounds in those two runs. Now, to me, two pounds doesn't really make any sort of difference. But mm -hmm. I just think if he can jump there, he's going to be ridden prominently. If he can clean up that jumping a little bit, he's, he's only an eight-year-old, still progressing. Um, 
I think this horse would have a fair shout. Not had many too many tries over the three mile trip. Definitely an out and out stayer. Um, so perhaps a little bit of value around ten to one for, for a clear surf, but uh, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be overly confident in taking on the two at the top of the market as, as you can expect. But yeah. you know, all these unexposed horses nowadays they always go to the top of the market. It's funny because years ago they had unexposed horses into a field and the general consensus basically was that they didn't have experience for a race yeah. like this and now it's completely flipped on its head so this would normally be an angle where i'd be looking at the top of the market and going okay they put the unexposed horse in at the top of the market how can i get him beat and where what do i know about this horse of the market doesn't know but in this particular case these two at the top of the market are very very strong unexposed horses so um not an overly confident shout but i give a clear surf in each way in each way chance yeah, so Daryl, as you say, you don't want to really be putting people away or off of Jericho Rock or Karak Rambler no. then over ahead of a market. But like I say, I can see 12s actually about Eclair Surf. So that's a, a nice each way shout to go with this. And I, I agreed. I thought he was one of the, the real big dangers in this race. Uh, so fascinating there. Andrew, your take on this race, please. Yeah, tricky one, isn't it? Um, six of the last seven winners of this race wore headgear, three of them in first time headgear. So I was I had a very good look at Not a Chance last year's winner who um, is running off a similar mark. He's got the visor on for the first time, but he hasn't exactly set the world alight um, since winning this race last year. So it's generally a race that Alan King's got a good record in. Um, I, I could could have done without the, the dry forecast, really, for the hollow ginge. Uh, he goes well when fresh. He's been off the track. Uh, he, so he ran really well in his comeback, as he usually does. Disappointed next time. He's had a break since. He's four from seven over hurdles or fences when he's been off for more than five weeks uh, on proper soft or heavy going. But I just worry this is probably going to dry out to sort of good to soft, tacky ground mm-hmm. come Saturday. The Korash Rambler, I mean, I think he's going to turn out to be the best horse in this race. But he's he's ridden patiently and he's never won in the big field. So, you know, there's the sort of luck in running um, that's going to be needed here. I know um, when, when Lucinda Russell won this um with one for half, that one came from off the pace. But then, of course, that one turned out to be much better than his mark and uh, went on to win the Grand National. Generally speaking... Sorry, right? Andrew, 336 miles is how far Lucinda, traveled, Lucinda has travelled for this. Really? But, I mean, again, uh, um, it's not the easiest race to win when coming from off the pace. And, you know, the number of times you've seen a horse who's a fairly big price just get into a rhythm out in front, like in Milan Spa, for example, in the first time, Blinkers under uh, Brani a few, uh, few years ago. So would it surprise me if he sort of weaved his way through and won going away and turned out to be a great, you know, a, a much better horse? Not at all, but at the prices, I can leave him alone. Jericho Rock, same thing. I mean, it's very rare for a six-year-old to run in this. Uh, mm. I, think, I think I could only find two in the last sort of, uh, 10 or 20 years when I was looking at the stats earlier mm. on. Um, so I, I was going to just throw a dart at uh, no rematch for Evan Williams, a uh, yard that's been in good form. Hated the right-handed track at Exeter last time out, jumps out to his left, and he's got a good record at this time of year. I think he's run about 18 to 1 or something mm. like that, but it wasn't a race that I was confident in. I mean, Achille could go well last year's runner-up, you know, despite being a 12-year-old. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I, I probably spent far too long on this, thinking oh, it's the big race, I've got to find a bet, and then couldn't find one. So uh, yeah, yeah. Ten, tentative each way shout on no rematch. Yeah, I was going to say, Captain right, Tommy, right. of course. Captain Tommy's and he got four lemons to five of not a chance. He's got an eleven pound swing. Mm. Um, I think he's been crying out to go further than three miles or three mile one, but uh, very, very wide open. Yeah, it is, and uh, yeah, Captain Tommy around sixteen to one shot, and then around eighteens for no rematch. Then for Andrew, but yeah, really tricky races, and this is only one of two races that I have had a bet in or I have a selection in because I, I can't resist the classic chase. And my concern about those two at the head of a market was the novice angle in here because you look back through I mean not a chance when he won this last year not a novice Kimberlite Candy not a novice impulsive star was technically a novice but he had had a uh, season chasing them prior Milan's bar not a novice one for Arthur not a novice so you know you do you, for all that they do look as though they're going to work up into being the best horses in this race and in time I'm just concerned about this race for them with as you said Daryl that sort of lack of experience for all the unexposed profile sees them off of nice marks it looks like so I was looking at sort of more of the battle hardened types and my long short list I narrowed it down to was paddle your own canoe who is fascinating but with the skeleton angle potentially in there Eclessa dare I say at Jerry's back oh god but I I haven't back sided with him for about two years and I've been delighted I haven't 
Um, but I just, he just beat so many of these trends for me in this race. But I just, I can't, I can't have it with Jerry still. And Chirico Vallis. Now, gun to my head, the main selection would be Chirico Vallis, who, again, I'm getting a nice price about here, around 16 to 1, um, which is a fairly big price because he's had the one start this season, which is ideal. He won that at Chepstow in the Native River Handicap Chase. He made all, which you rarely see from a J.P. McManus horse. So you, straight away, it looked as though he was fancy to win that Chepstow race. Only has a £5 rise to contend with. He'll likely be ridden positively again here. Again, as we've all said, a positive for this race. And yes, he is a 10-year-old, but he has plenty of chasing experience to go with that. Another positive. So for all that those novices look flashy and unexposed, I'd rather side with a battle-hardened type. And that is Chirico Vallis for me. So he will be my selection. And he's actually going to be my nap of the weekend as well, because I don't really know what to do with this weekend's racing. So I thought I may as well nap a 16 to one shot and, and roll with that. So we will move on to the 335 at Warwick. Who knows, with our next race, it's another Thames handicap hurdle qualifier for five rods and over, over three mile one. We do only have seven runners where I was expecting much more, to be honest. Um, so, Andrew, who wants to win this one? Because all bar one of these um, will qualify <laughs> for the final, provided they get around. Yeah, who, uh, wants, so, who, who, decided? who wants to win? None of the above, probably. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, um, uh, Riggs, or sorry, Riggs, the skeleton horse, might be appropriately named. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a minefield, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I guess th third wind could be in a receipt of an easy lead. Um, I mean, he's um, running in a handicap for the first time in a while. And um, I think the last time he ran in one, he was um, fourth in the Per Thames final behind um, Saad de Burley in 2020. Mm -hmm. I mean, Saad de Burley, this is his first handicap run since that Per Thames win as well. Sporting John, does he need a stronger pace? Is he off? I mean, God almighty, it's a complete nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the, the one that I mean, one of the angles in these races, we've talked about previously about Kansas City Chief and horses like that, is to look at the older horses who haven't got one eye on their handicap mark for the final. They're quite happy to pick up a part of sort of 10, 12, 15 grand, whatever you get for winning one of these races. Um, so that did me, make me look at Keeper Hill. Mm. Warren, Great Rocks has, Warren, Warren Great Rex even hasn't got the greatest record when he's um, um, reverts one from fences to hurdles. But, you know, Keeper Hill, um, you know, won this in 2019 off a one pound lower mark. Record in January and February is three wins, three third places, and an unplaced effort from seven starts. So, um, I mean, I'm not have you got a price there for Keeper Hill? It's going to yeah, be, 20 to one. Yeah, the absolute, I mean, uh, he's an 11 year old. I'd sort of chuck a couple of quid at him because he's not bothered about you know going up in the weights before um the Pro Temps final at Cheltenham in March. He'd be quite happy to win this, I would have thought. The mm. other one uh, I like is uh, Alpha Philippe for Fergal O'Brien, who uh, we haven't seen for 302 days, but obviously goes well when fresh. And, um, you know, I, I thought was sort of they're, they're, you know, progressive when we last saw him. So, um, yeah, I mean, Alpha Philippe um, and um, uh, Keeper Hill, the two I was, I was looking at, but yeah, it's just a who's trying, who's not. You know, yes. Take your pick. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's the P word, isn't it? The Potemps uh, qualifier. And with with all bar one of these, if they get around qualifying, it's, yeah, makes it very tricky. So keep a hill around 20 to 1 or Alaphilippe around 10 to 3. Daryl, solve this minefield, please. <laughs> yeah, there's only three trying, so you have mentioned two of them, Andrew. Yeah. Um, the reason the German man and, and side the Burley are in this is because they've moved the Potemps qualifier in Ireland from February back to Christmas. Mm. So they've had their two qualifiers now. The only way they can qualify for the attempt is by coming over here uh, into this race and, and one or two more. But um, I wouldn't even give a second glance to the jam <laughs> man who's up 146 mm, yeah. and, and side the Burley is up 158. Sporting John as well. I've heard that he's, um, he's going to be going to to the attempt. So he's just hoping to qualify here. He's up 151. Third wind, very similar. Um, mm. They're all going to the attempt. I can't see Keeper Hill going going that way. I hope he doesn't win because I've dutched the two at the top of the market. <laughs> um, Riggs stayed on really, really nicely last night. He's definitely better than a mark of 132. So I, I thought he would um, he would go very, very close in this. He stayed on really well behind Don Levon at uh, Haydock last time. He's got he's definitely got more to offer. And Ala Philippe, who's got a uh, great record, fresh. Been off 300 days, but was a really good fifth in the Albert Bartlett when last seen. This is just an out-and-out -out stayer. Hopefully, he's fit and well to do himself justice. 
if mm. Keeper Hill wins this, I'll be furious. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be livid because I've touched the two and well, the only uh, other one. Tw- Twenty to one, probably try. bigger on the day. You can afford to stick up, like, put a few quid on. Just yeah, to get your yeah. stake back if the if the miracle happens. That's yeah, I, I think I will do that because I think that's unacceptable. But uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, th- I thought that was the. I thought this was what it was. I mean, this is what you get when you have a stupid qualifying system for the pretends. You get horses running in races that are not trying. You, what's the point in pricing them up? Because I mm. feel sorry for Joe Bloggs on the street who doesn't really know doesn't what's really. going on. They yeah. go in and say, "Oh, I like the look of that," or the jam man. I had jam on total small. I don't know how these people. I don't know how it works, but. You know, and then they're these poor sorts of taking these prices when yeah. they're not even here to. You know, it's a stupid, stupid qualifying system. It needs to be mm-hmm. changed. It's absolutely ridiculous. Win yeah. and you're in. That's what it should make more races. Win and you're in. Yeah, or at least just down to you know, even four places, let alone three. But like you say, sort of winning you're in the first two, if worse can come soon. Well, I still think they should, they should wait until after the race, and then they should spin the wheel, and it will come <laughs> yeah. down at one, two, three, four, five, or six, which is how many uh, the, of the first, however many home qualify. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 this bit, this spin the wheel um, idea that you've had, Andrea, I think the more that we talk about it, the more it might gain legs and then we might actually uh, get this any in the paddock at Cheltenham prior to the off and we'll see how we go. Um, yes, absolute nightmare of a race and, and let's, don't don't be don't be fooled into thinking half these horses are off either. Daryl, your hand is up. So yes, Yeah, please. I was just going to say um, that I forgot to mention that uh, Sire de Burley, Mm. Was second in the stayers hurdle, wasn't he? Yes. Last year. Yeah. So I wonder if that's the route that they go with him. Ah. So what? Just a just a team up. So forgetting their potential and going back to stayers hurdle. Mm. So just strange that he comes. Just strange that he comes here for this potential qualifier. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, qualify, he could have ran yeah. in a in a greater race in Ireland, but. Maybe it fits in with the time perspective. I don't know, but oh my god, it's conspiracy, isn't it? Yeah, conspiracy. you're going to back that one as well. Now that's four. Yeah, <laughs> four of the seven. Rigs a win. Rigs a win. Yeah, but um, but like you say, yeah, side of Burley. They trying to double bluff us. What are they doing? Yeah, trying to get into the mind of a of a JP McManus set up to see if they're double bluffing us is a whole other can of worms mm-hmm. to be getting into, even more so than the pretense. So, who knows? Who knows? But Daryl's going to back um, most of the field uh, just to save on potential fury, but dutching the top two. But goodness me, um, wild anyway. Right. So anything else from Warwick, Daryl? Any other conspiracy theories or anything else you're dutching or any other selections, please? Hang on, let me check my notes. <laughs> Hold on. What have we got? Oh, just to keep an eye on that Rona McNally horse in the, um, in the 1240 petrol head. Don't... Mm. I mean... He won very, very cosy last night at Ferry House. Um, yes. Another one that's coming over here to exploit the handicapping system. But just worth keeping an eye on. I don't know if he'll be gambled or what price. He'll probably open up favourite, to be honest with you. But So, yeah. no, long and short of it, no. <laughs> no worries. But, yeah, keep an eye. I haven't got any prices for the 1240 at Warwick. But number three, Petrol Head, keep an eye on for that man, Ronan McNally. Andrew, anything else from Warwick, please? Uh, no, not for me. Thanks, Kate. No worries. Sure, we will move on then to Kempton, our second meeting on the day. And we start with the 1.32, uh, where we have a huge field kickstarter. So Kempton, just a seven runners again to open a 0 to one forty handicap chase for five rods and over, over two mile four and a half furlong. So Andrew, not many more runners uh, than most of our Warwick races. So who do you side with in our first race at Kempton, please? Yeah, I quite like this race, but the, those bookmakers who took a chance and started betting on it on Monday and Tuesday, could have done their absolute cobblers because um, you know if, if you knew your you know horse was an intended runner you could have had six to one about Champagne Court is now five to two favourite seven to one about Capital Two is a hundred to thirty um, tens about Foxborough is now fours uh, I didn't like the favourite Champagne Court um, mm. he's only ever won in November and December outside those two months he's naught from fourteen so uh, although he won last time out you know he normally goes off the boil um, round about this time of year is Again, very possibly, and at five to two, I can you know um, bet that he's going to um, go backwards here. Capital T is the one that I like, and one, one of five of his last six starts, and uh, it's, it's just looked extremely progressive. And um, you know, I thought he should be favourite. Really, he might be on the day. Um, Fanzio, I didn't like. I mean, he's a fairly shortish price. I mean, I love Fanzio as a horse, but Fanzio's got a, 
proper case of the oxos and you know good run bad run good run etc yeah. and uh, you know he was second last time out i think he'll go backwards he normally does once he puts in a good effort so beware him falco blitz is a funny one um he, he keeps jumping out to his left on right-handed tracks i put him up as a better banger last time out and he pulled up um you know maybe it was a three-mile trip that found him out he's coming back in trip which will suit I, I mean, I keep laying them when he goes right-handed. Keep, uh, he keeps finishing second or third, so I tend to lay him for a place and do my dough. But uh, <laughs> just be, be wary about taking a horse, taking six to one about a horse who's probably going to lose a lot of his ground by shifting out to his mm. left. Twenty twenty, he's only ever won at Fontwell and Plumpton. I wasn't totally convinced Kemp to be his track. And Locks Corner is a funny one because he tends to win his first start of the year, but normally they sort of rough him off after November time, bring him back in the spring or usually the summer. Yeah, I think. Last two years, he's come back in May and August, and, and he's won. Um, so I just thought it was a bit odd that he's coming back so early this time around. Mm -hmm. Probably not his time of year. So, uh, yeah, Capo Toy, uh, I thought, should be favourite. He's 132nd favourite at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 130, 72 then for Capo Toy. And probably should be the rightful favourite then, according to Andrew, to take on Champagne Court there. Daryl, your assessment of this race, please. Yeah, I like Champagne Court. I think, oh, he sits no. <laughs> a, I think he sits on a very fair uh, handicap mark. In fact, he's one off higher. Um, he'll be ridden prominently, which is what I like here at Kempton mm. a lot of the time. I think the tongue tie and cheap piece combination looks to have sparked him into life. Um, uh, so I think he can. I think he's a horse that's always had the potential to be better than what he what he has been. But it's mm. only been the last two starts that the tongue tie cheap piece combination's gone on. So I think he is entitled to to put to bed any myths about him running well in the spring and stuff. Um, I think he was all out last time at Exeter, but I think the switch defence is, uh, this is not a strong race. This is certainly not as strong as what he was contesting when he was over fences, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. The trip's fine, the ground's perfect. Uh, like I said, I think he arrives here in good form. His first win since 2018. Um, I think he could be a bit of a bus. You wait for one, he comes along with two. So uh, yeah. hopefully he can go in. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a massively strong opinion, but I do think he's the right favourite, and I do think he's the most likely winner. Yeah, so the lads taking each other on then with the two at the head of the market, Daryl with Champagne Course and then Andrew with Cap or Toy. So that's going to be a fascinating clash then in the 132 at Kempton. We will move on to the 205. It's another grade two in the form of the Silvignaco Conti chase for five-year-olds and over, over two mile, four and a half furlongs where we're down to just the four runners now. So after the extra money that they pumped into this race with the hope of getting more runners, that just hasn't made a difference, unfortunately. But it's an intriguing contest nonetheless. Mr. Fisher currently heading the market. So, Daryl, how do you play this race? Oh, this, oh, this, um, <laughs> this is my nap of the day in here. Ooh. And, it's, um, and it's definitely the soil. <gasps> I was so hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> Honestly, this is one of the best bets of the day. I, I really do think that. This is... This is a terrible race for a starter. Mr. Fisher was awful at uh, at Kempton last time. I know it was in the mm. King George, but my God, he won't he won't travel in the yard. He was, yeah, it was, it was terrible. Even Nico de Boinville's not not got back on. Not even Sean Bowen's <laughs> got back on. James has gone and got on. Um, so I don't know what on earth would would make me back him at eleven to eight for this. God no. Um, <laughs> Rouge Biff, I thought should have probably been favourite for this on the basis that he's probably going to get a soft lead out in front. And I think Alf is really going to try and take him on. Mm. I still don't think though that he is a he's a I still don't think he's a one sixty rate chaser. Mm. I really don't. I know he won a handicap off one five six previously, so he's had to like sort of go he has had 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 to go up in the ratings, but if you go back and look at that handicap he won now, my goodness me, it was terrible. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced by Rouge Biff. I think he's going to set it up, and I'm hoping he's going to set it up for Deppy. Mm -hmm. El Dorado Allen, I don't... All of his runs have come. At Huntington, Exeter, Shelton, Donk, big galloping track. Mm -hmm. He was outpaced at Huntington last time. He stayed on quite strongly. I know it was behind yeah. first flow, and that was it was a decent contest, but I really don't think Kempton's going to shoot, suit him. Sharp right-handed track. I really don't. I think this is Deffy's moment. And I, I really think the Kempton track's going to suit him. Last time at Ascot, when he reappeared after 300 days off, I thought he travelled through the race really well. Yeah. I thought he was travelling lovely, strongly, taking a pull. It looked like he had a bit of his old zest back. Yeah. That was over two miles five. That's the first time he's been beyond 
two miles four. And it's the mm-hmm. first time he's ran beyond two miles since, since his JLT win in 2019. Mm-hmm. This slight coming back in trip at this sharp track, I just think it's going to suit him superbly well. He's in receipt of the weight of, of six pounds from Mr. Fisher. He's in receipt of six pounds from El Dorado Allen. That puts him clear on ratings. Mm-hmm. The handicap has dropped him his official rating in two starts from 168 down to 158. So he couldn't even have more, more than that in hand. He bounced back from a poor defeat a few years back uh, to Layla at Cheltenham, I think it was, um, second time out. I think he's going to improve a ton for that for that seasonal return run after 300 days off. I think he's the best horse in the race by a country mile. Mm-hmm. I just hope that he, he, it Honestly, he looked to me last time at Ascot that he was travelling really strong and he just tired, just got tired. Um, the time before at Ascot, when he was fifth behind first flow, he looked like he needed a wind operation. He looked like he just cut out. So mm-hmm. they gave him that wind operation, 300 days off. At Ascot, I thought it was a very satisfactory run. Um, and now here at Kempton, I think this small field is going to suit him. He's going to sit just off Rouge fifth. He's going to tank into the race. He's going to quick and clear. There is, oh my God, how is he six to one? <laughs> the outside of a lot. One? Yeah. Yeah. So you, so that is going to be your nap of the weekend as well, then, Daryl is definitely. I would not. Factor. I would not have him beaten, Kate. I would not <laughs> hear of it. I can tell. I can tell that. Yeah. <laughs> if Deppy reverts back to himself, he is for sure. Again, for me, the best source in this race. It is just that if, but Daryl's made a really good case there for why Deppy should be seen back in a much better light than for that reappearance start as well. So I like that. And at six to on the outsider of a lot, Daryl is going for Deppy. Andrew, can you boost the confidence you're signing against him? Mm-hmm. Well, I was surprised to see Deffy just saw him running it. I thought he'd been retired and not so so much of it recently. But I mean, maybe it was the trip, maybe it was the ground, maybe it was lack of fitness or a combination of all three that beat him at Ascot last time. But he was well supported. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see him bounce back second run after the wind off. It's a horrible race, isn't it? I mean, El Dorado Allen, I didn't like it. I thought he should have done better at Huntington last time, given that there was a pace collapse and it was he was one of two who was with a realistic chance who held up the winner first flow. And El Dorado Allen, the, the fact that he you know, couldn't finish better than third has to go down as disappointing. Vuj, uh, Rouge Viv, it's sort of, you know, the jury's still out as to um, you know, how he's going to get on for Nichols. You still get the impression he's got spring targets and this is just mm. a stepping stone to those. Mr. Fisher, uh, I'm perhaps a, a bit more forgiving about that King George run. I mean, I, I bet him that day, he's never travelling at the back of the field. A smaller field, if he reverts to his forcing tactics or more prominent tactics which have held him in better stead in the past. And again, I think if it was going to be heavy ground or soft, heavy in places, definitely would be a fantastic bet. Now, what they're calling it now, soft, good to soft in places and mm. drying out, it can dry out quite quick, quick yeah. attempt. And, um, but yeah, I mean, Daryl's made a fantastic case for him. I'll, I'll side with Mr. Fisher, uh, just to put the mockers on that one to make life easier for Daryl's pick. <laughs> Oh, well done. Very, what a team player. What a team player you are, Andrew. <laughs> to help out Daryl's nap there, yes, yeah, put the mockers on Mr. Fisher then for him at the head of the market. But yeah, really, really tricky race. And we were going to move on to the 240 now. We finally have another betting heat in the form of the Lanzarote Handicap Hurdle, which is a listed handicap for four year olds and over, over two mile five, where Marie's Rock has been well backed as the current market leader at around 11 to 2 in the hope of bidding, well, hoping of gaining back to back course and distance wins. But, Andrew, who do you like in this race, please? Yeah, this this is a belter. This is, you know, far more interesting than everything else we've had so far we've been talking else? about put together. Um, I mean, we had a big shock in this race last year, didn't we, with Bore and mm. Bill? There were two reasons for that. I mean, one, he had course form. You know, he just got chinned over course and distance when third the time before. And he, he went wide round the outside. Massive wide bias at that Kempton meeting. They started coming wide in the first race that day. Uh, Nico de Boimba was very slow to uh, realise, and he was towards the inner when he was on a six-to-one shot that was pulled up in this race for Henderson last year. Was it Glenn or Glenn? Um, so if you're on Marie's Rock, you've just got to hope that he stays wide if there is that same bias in place again. He was uh, widest of all on Marie's Rock when he went over course and distance last time. Very impressive the way that she kicked clear that day and uh, back, you know, uh, up in trip. So, you know, wouldn't put you off if you want to be on uh, Marie's Rock. But, you know, she is 5-1 to one favourite in a huge field handicap. I didn't want to be on anything that was likely to be on the front end here, like Green Book. I want to be on something mm-hmm. that's going to come from off the pace. Um, Don Levant was semi-interesting for Evan Williams, um, but there was a couple I liked at silly prices that I was going to back each way. Um, 
We've seen uh, the Mickey Hammond yard um, going particularly well at the moment. And uh, this Foster's Island mm. uh, uh, sort of amazes me because trained up north in, in England where there aren't many right-handed tracks. You've got Carlisle and then you've got to come down, you know, as far as market raising in Leicester if you want to find a right-handed track. Keeps running left-handed, keeps winning despite jumping out to his right. You know, he is a Carlisle winner. You'd think going right-handed again is going to suit him. Um, you know, he's he's got up five pounds for that latest um, you know, dead heat victory, but I still think there's loads more to come. And he tends to come from off the pace as well. So big field's going to suit. I mean, some firms are paying seven places, I think, in this race. Six is general. You know, um, everyone is a five at least. So you're really looking for horses who are going to be held up and going to you know, you know, come from off the pace and get into that first sort of half dozen. So uh, Foster's Island's the first. The other one is uh, John Joe's horse, Carey's Commodity. Oh, Andrew, um, you literally picked out my two. Yes, please. I'm delighted you have. But yes, please carry on. <laughs> Don't believe a word of it. You're making up his go along. <laughs> Standard in my life. <laughs> the, thing, the thing with Carey's Commodity is he needs a big field, strong pace scenario. You look at those wins. Well, you look at his record in fields of 12 or more runners. He's, you know, he seemed to finish first or second, or he, he did unseat once in a bumper when he's basically tried to get out the paddock uh, exit. <laughs> but uh, since they put the chip pieces on, fields of 12 or more runners, first, first, and first. Um, that eight-runner affair, slow pace, I think the winner made all at Hereford, just didn't suit him at all. Um, you know, He's not really had op many opportunities since he had wind surgery. He was in the process of running a good race over fences at Stratford when he tipped up. Um, that was behind uh, Capo Toy, a horse we mentioned uh, a minute ago. So back over hurdles last time, probably needed the run to get used to hurdles again and it just wasn't run to suit. So he's going to be a lot happier. Tongue ties going on for the first time, added to those cheap pieces. He's, I mean, I've seen 40 to 1 about him, 33 to 1 Foster's Island. You get back that pair each way, six places. I think you have a bit of, uh, bit of fun for your money. Oh, curse you, Andrew, but I'm also <laughs> delighted at the same time that you literally two, the two I have. And I thought, ha ha, I'm being a genius here. I've come up with two at 33 and 40 to one here. And yeah, and straight away swooped in there then with Andrew, siding with the same two horses of Foster's Island and Carey's. Come on, on Daryl, make it a hat trick. Yeah, go on, Daryl. Go go for the 40 to one and the 33 well, he, to one. I know track. he loves Marie's Rock. Surely he's going to go for it. <laughs> Surely wins, doesn't she? God, that was super <laughs> impressive, wasn't it? Super yeah. impressive over course and distance last time. Um, I think she's a very, very talented horse. There was talk mm -hmm. about her for a champion hurdle at one point. I know that and we're up and trip now. But uh, I think going up and trip has just helped her travel through the early part of her races quick better rather than feeling like she's rushed. I went back and watched a few of her... Mm -hmm few of her two mile runs and she just looked like she was always being hurried along um so the fact that she was winning over two miles is probably going to end up being a, uh, a big bonus i think this trip is probably spot on for her i don't I wouldn't want to see her over three miles just yet but uh, mm. i think this trip is spot on this quick kempton track is exactly what she likes um i think she's much better than, than 140 in all honesty I, I, I like this race i went i race and was like right let's find something like you two this one's like a big prize let's let's get stuck in there's really lots to like about a lot of these horses um earth lord for example could be better than 133 copper's dreams a nice horse um, i nearly came habit cliffs for dan skelton i think mm. he's been crying out for the step up and trip he's a 33 but i just kept coming back to marie's rock i just think that she's going to finally um take a step forward and, and finally you know build on what build on her early promise i think she's just so fast and i think mm. um the, the fact that we've got big field here i think it's going to help her settle she's just going to come fast and late and i think she'll travel there really nicely and just quicken away um i'm hope i pray to god that chitty bello doesn't win this right because i think <laughs> i've got chair bello on my radar for the coral cup yeah um, now i think if this would have been the target harry skelton would have been on on board Mm -hmm. Then Tristan Durrell, all due respect to Tristan Durrell, but I watched the race at Hereford last time, as well as the race at Newbury previous to that, and it looked like they were just um, giving him a very easy time of things. This horse is um, definitely well handicapped, that's absolutely for sure. If they decide they wanted to win this with Chittabella of 142, they absolutely could. But I'm hoping that's not the case today, and uh, I'm hoping Marie's Rock is, is going to win this and then going to into May's company at the festival perhaps but uh, I think she's mm. she's better than 140 Do you think yeah. Chidabello will um, run here down the field 
have a wind up and then come back fresh for Cheltenham because we talked about him before that he tends to win or go very close on his first start back after a wind up. And this is the only season, well, I think, uh, ever or certainly for several years, he's not had a wind up um, before his reappearance. Yeah, well, yeah I hope so. Oh, after this, there you go, put you back, Gary. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't want to see him again. I hope so. I wouldn't want to see him again after this because he's mm. got a great record fresh as well, Andrew, like you say. But uh, yeah. um, surely there is some there is some sort of plan with him, um, and I'd be disappointed in all honesty if, if this if this was it. Um, but yeah, hopefully put away wind operation. Seen again at the festival, Coral Cup. He's around twenty five to one if you if you want to have a couple of quid on him. But mm. I would just suggest. Um, Waiting until after this race because you're you're not gonna he's not gonna shorten up on the back of this he's probably only gonna push thirty threes and if he wins this then he's probably not gonna go so um, hold fire and just keep keep an eye on him but I think there's a big chance it in the Coral Cup there. Yeah, that's a bit of a win-win sort of situation, really. And Derek, your, your signal was just cutting in and out there, but we got most of the audio anyway, at least. So, But uh, yeah, Chitabello definitely to watch because say if he wins there, he won't go to the county hurdle. And if he doesn't win here and he is just given that run to, to get him out, then he's probably going to drift to a much bigger price than for the count, uh, for the county, sorry, for the Coral uh, as an 11-year-old. But yeah, watch out then for that freshen up in the wind operation. But Marie's rock to hopefully fulfil all that potential. We know the race will be run to suit her as well. So yeah, she is pretty solid at the head of market but I agreed with Andrew though as well of course with as I said with Foster's Island but I'm just concerned that I mean he is only a one two three rated horse and he has only had the three weeks since that last run rather than Carey's commodity I'd still back him anyway as a saver but Carey's commodity at a bigger price again than was the one who ticked most boxes with me as long as he is just ridden with restraint here fitted with a first time tongue tie here as well to go with his usual cheap pieces wearing uh, that for the first time since his wind operation that he had prior to his reappearance, two starts back as well, fell um, at the last when he said, Andrew, he was going well at that point at Stratford before just a nothing he run last time out. But we know of this race, you, you also don't have to have sided with a horse that ran well last time out necessarily. And if a tongue tie can make the difference with him, then he's a very well handicapped horse winning off of just a two pound lower mark in November 2020. But as I say, Hope he's ridden with restraint. Think of a track will suit him. And in a very difficult race, I will also give a chance to the outsider of the entire field. Now, we round off our scheduled action in the 315 at Kempton. This is a 0 to 150 handicap chase for five year olds and over, over three miles, where Caribbean Boy, well, he doesn't actually, is vying for favouritism with Smarty Wild at the head of the market. And Caribbean Boy, obviously, hoping to get further than the first, which he didn't manage last time out when he was sure to win. I don't care what anyone says. He was cruising at the time. Uh, so, Daryl, back to you for this race, please. Um, yeah, I've I really struggled with this, Kate, in all honesty. Yeah. Um, I can see why Smarty was top of the market. He's, uh, he's pretty solid. He's pretty consistent. Can throw in a few hairy jumps, but, uh, it's, I mean, there's nothing really wrong with him. It's just he's not really progressing, is he? Caribbean boy, this horse is over there all the time. Um, no matter where he runs, I think he's over bet and, and I just don't want nothing to do with him, really. I don't think he's got a great record right down right-handed either, if I remember correctly, zero for three. Um, I thought double shuffle was interesting as the outsider of the field, but I spoke to um, your fella straight after the wing counter race, and um, mm -hmm. he, he just said to me that he's just a clever horse and that he he just if he doesn't want to do it he doesn't want to do it sort of thing so yeah. perhaps it might be a bit of age catching up with him um mm. but the return to kempton might just spark him back and, and the first time tongue tie is interesting um i was going to side with kitty's light reluctantly because i think kitty's light wants a, a galloping track you know a real strong pace galloping track a true test i think this might be too sharp for kitty's light but last time at uh, over course and distance i just thought that William Kennedy just gave this horse too much to do. I'd like to see them ride kitties like a bit more forward at a track like this. Um, yeah. Nothing came from off the pace that day when Five Star gets away one at, at Kempton. Um, but Kitty's like finished fourth, beating 13 lengths, but did the best of those who held up or, or from the midfield. Um, I do think there's a, a win in Kitty's light, been dropped another four pounds by the handicap of that Kempton run. Jack Tudor's back on board, takes another three off. So effectively seven pounds lower here. Um, it's, it's pretty uh, a real consistent horse, a real nice horse. Yeah. Just, just runs runs his race all the time. Uh, so I thought he would be a solid angle if he wanted to have a bet in the race, but I won't be having a bet in this. 
No, it is. It is that type of a, a race, isn't it? But yeah, Kitty's like he's just ridden that bit more prominently. He's just a he's just a dude, isn't he? He's an absolute wonderful horse. We'd all love to own. Uh, but yeah, tricky, tricky final scheduled race. Andrew, do you have any stronger opinions? Yeah, it's a pile of crap, isn't it? I mean, it's not <laughs> a terrible race. This that is, is a, a strong opinion. <laughs> this is a Saturday televised race. You've got eight runners. Five of them failed to get round last time. Four of them okay. pulling up. The others finished third, fourth, and eleventh. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Say, I mean, what a what a state British race. I mean, um, yeah. My my heart says uh, last year's winner, Double Shuffle, who won it as an eleven year old last year. He loves his track, as we mm. know. Um, but I'll just side with uh, Artois Phil, who. You thought he's had his annual run that was at uh, Cheltenham behind Vienna Court last time because since he's gone from Gordon Elliott to Gary Moore, you know, he had one run February 2020, one, one run last year, finishing fourth uh, of, uh, over two and a half miles here, getting outpaced behind Smarty Wild, and then uh, say that run last year. So it's it's amazing they're getting two runs into him in a, in a short space of time. Mm. So, you know, he's obviously been very difficult to train, but I just thought with Gary Moore in such good form at the moment and him having a rare second run of the season rather than being roughed off for a year after that comeback run at Cheltenham, maybe Artois Phil can uh, run a good race here. But, I mean, Smarty Wild is, doesn't jump very well. He always attracts support and um, it's hot in the mouth time if you're back in. Mm-hmm. You, know, uh, you know, he sort of, he, he comes out travelling well. Next minute, bang, he's clouded one and he's finished third again. So, He's not for me at seven or two. Similar reservations about Caribbean boy. Kitty's light. You're a bit worried about the the um, patient running style, but you know. But yeah, for goodness sake, how is this a televised Saturday <laughs> not two hundred and fifty handicap? It's shocking. We had a not to one hundred and five televised last Saturday, of course. So this is a yeah, just yeah. Le- Le- but... Leona Mayer's bought a new caravan handicap. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that was much more interesting than this rubbish. Goodness me. Yeah, yeah, for sure it was. But yeah, really, really uh, tricky race over. Andrew Said, well, giving a favourable mention to a couple of the old boys in here in Double Shuffle and Etois Phil, both a couple of 12-year-olds, but mainly going with the outsider of the field there, 14 to 1 Etois Phil. But yeah, really tricky to have a confident selection in that race. So, Andrew, I will head back to you for anything else from Kempton, please. Uh, no, nothing for me, thank you. Nope. And Daryl, yourself, from anything else from Kempton? Yes, the last race is the race that probably should be on TV instead of this one. Yeah. It's a decent handicap hurdle, 0 140. Um, Grisby the Burst for Alan King. Uh, this horse is definitely better than a mark of 123. Um, he needed the run last time at Taunton, seasonal reappearance, but he travelled through the race really strongly. Um, I think he's going to come on a good bit for that. Beat mm. Cabot Cliffs last year in a novice hurdle at uh, Huntington. Very, very easily. Cabot Cliffs is obviously rated 134. This horse is, uh, I think he's got a big, big chance here. He's um, He could be a bit keen. So I like the drop back to two miles here. He was running over two, three at Taunton. Drop back and trip. Definitely should suit him. Good race, though. Good race for the grade. There's probably going to be a few in here to follow going forward. But Grisby the burst. This is your time, my boy. <laughs> I haven't got any braces, but yeah, Grisby the burst. Uh, horse number eight there in the 3.50 at Kempton on a non-televised race, which probably should be. So, Darrow, anything else from anywhere else? No, we've got the winner this week. Uh-huh. <laughs> in death. In deafy. <laughs> yeah, deafy the soul. Yeah. And, uh, Andrew, just before we get your nap then, anything from anywhere else? A uh, couple of your weather. The, the first race at Chelmsford on Saturday night, the 4.15, crazy paving. Who um, was third at twenty to one over course and distance um, last week? Uh, always goes well at this time of year. Absolutely useless um, pre New Year, but tends to do particularly well in January and February. So he should go well again. And subliminal at Lingfield, that's in the two fifty five. Got a good record in January. Simon Dow's runners tend to go well at this time of year. So uh, yeah, um, crazy paving and subliminal on the all weather. Mm-hmm. Yep, so Subliminal, 2.55 then at Lingfield and then in the 4.15. Uh, another old boy then for Andrew and Crazy Paving, the 10-year-old there at Chelmsford. So, yeah, and uh, so, Daryl, we've got your nap. We know that already. That's Daffy Desoy in the 2.05 at Kempton. Andrew, your nap, please. Um, I'll go Cap uh, Capo Toy at uh, Kempton, take on uh, Daryl Champagne Court. 
Okay. Oh, goodness me. Yeah, right. He's definitely <laughs> throwing down the gauntlet then, uh, quite notably so than Andrew versus Daryl. And mine up, I'm going to go for Chirico Vallis, horse number seven in the three o'clock at Warwick. Another tricky weekend of betting and racing and angles to have found then for the lads. So thank you so much to the pair of them for all of their hard work this weekend. An awful lot covered. Thank you to our sponsors, SBK. Thank you so much to all of you for watching. Enjoy this weekend's action and we will see you again next week.